Today's scripture reading is from the book of John in the New Testament, chapter 17, verses 6 through 19. Jesus said, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. This is God's word. Good morning. The last time I was up here, I was getting to open our series on Mary. And this week I'm getting to close our series on the Upper Room Discourse, which is the evening when Jesus gathered his followers during Passover for a final meal and a final moment together before he would be arrested, ultimately taken to his death, um, before he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. So I want to frame a little bit what was going on at this meal. If you work in childcare or management at all, you know that if you can give people a heads up when a major change is coming, they're usually more likely to receive it a little better. And that's what Jesus is doing in this meal. He is saying, he's, he's saying with a clarity where before he might have spoken metaphorically, now he's speaking clearly. He's saying, listen, I am returning to God soon. I will not be with you anymore physically, but I will not be leaving you alone. I will continue to provide for you when I'm gone. And then he does something very simple yet very powerful. He prays to God for his disciples. He's not praying with them, nor is he recusing himself and praying somewhere by himself. He is having an intimate moment with God and inviting his disciples to witness that moment. Leo talked last week about the part of the prayer where Jesus covers the mission that he called his disciples to. This week we're gonna focus in um, on the joy that he leaves behind for his disciples. And we're gonna focus on one particular verse. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Joy can be a hard concept to pin down. Like many words, joy or happiness, the meaning changes when a different person is using it or based on a different context. So what kind of joy is Jesus talking about here? I listened recently to an interview with Dr. Robert Waldinger, who is a professor from Harvard who is overseeing the longest running research uh, project on human happiness. And he identified two terms that researchers use when they're talking about happiness, and they were really helpful to me. So the first is hedonic happiness. And that term hedonic is the same Greek root from which we get the word hedonism. And it has to do with more of our emotional mood shifts throughout the day. We all, well, we each have a different hedonic baseline based on primarily our genetics and our life circumstances where we kind of live, and it might go up or down throughout the day in response to things that happen. For example, I myself, I think, have a pretty high natural hedonic happiness level, but last week I had a social interaction that was just very unsuccessful. And in the car on the way home, I sent my friend this long rambling voice memo in which I talked about how, you know, human language 
as much as we try, it can never really bridge the gap between the experiences between two different people. And even though we're all very deeply interconnected, we're all ultimately isolated from each other, et cetera, et cetera. And I sent this voice memo, and I kind of forgot about it until a few hours later, I see her face pop up on my phone calling me very late in the evening. And I picked up and I said, I see you received my voice memo. I'm better. <laughs> and she was like, okay, good. Um, so so that's, that's sort of an example of that, right? Like, even though I took a major hit to my hedonic happiness, I was able to kind of return to that baseline by the end of the day. Then there's a second kind of happiness. And this one is not about emotional shifts in mood, but it's not even called happiness at all. It's called eudaimonic well-being. And this is a term that researchers use to describe the sense of being at full function, of having a life of meaning and purpose, of living a good life. The interviewer, after Dr. Weldinger described this eudaimonic well-being, asked him, can you, can you boil down eudaimonic well-being, can you boil down to one cardinal rule to which we could all adhere to live a good life? And Dr. Waldinger gave two. He said, first, to the best of your ability, take care of your health. And second, cultivate meaningful relationships. And that is not particularly shocking. It actually seems like the simplest thing in the world to say, but somehow it hits a little bit differently to say, no, studies have shown that people are less likely to get type two diabetes when they have warm, close relationships. They're less likely to have coronary heart disease when they have warm, meaningful relationships. And it hits differently as a Christian to look at that and say, oh, actually the scripture, right? The life of Jesus and what he calls us to do and how he calls us to live is actually backed up by science. I always love when that happens. And that's what Jesus is doing here in this conversation about joy. He's relying on something or he's invoking something like that eudonomic well-being, that deep sense of meaning for which we all yearn. And the Greek word for joy that John uses in this verse, hara, is defined in Strong's Concordance as cheerfulness or calm delight. I love that idea of calm delight because it emphasizes that we're not talking about a boost in mood. We're talking about a consistency, a surety, because of the one in whom we delight. I want to posit that the findings of this longest running research on human happiness is directly supported by the teaching of, but more importantly, the person of Jesus. The prayer that we're studying today is a reflection of who Jesus is and how we can know him through the divine, through each other, and through creation. So first, let's talk about our direct connection to the divine. When Jesus prays for his followers, he starts by asserting our place in the relationship with God. And he's speaking not to us, but directly to God here. So Jesus says, I have revealed you, God, to them, my followers, and they accepted your word and believed in what you said. And in that context of established, trusting relationship, Jesus says so plainly, I pray for them. It's such a powerful statement to me. Jesus is standing himself, placing himself in the gap as an intercessor between broken humans and almighty God. It's the ultimate eavesdropping opportunity, but rather than overhearing someone talk badly about us, we're getting to hear God advocate for us to God on our behalf. Jesus offers this prayer as a tool for his disciples, a way and an assurance that though he is leaving, he is not leaving us alone. And because of Jesus's intercessory work, we also have that same avenue now to the ear of God in our own prayer. The second avenue we have is scripture. Jesus says, for I gave them the words that you gave me and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. When I read that line, knew with certainty, it gives me a little bit of pause. How many things do you feel like you know with certainty? Maybe some of y'all are more decisive than I am, but I feel like my imagination is just so powerful. There's very few things that I could feel like I say I know with certainty. And it makes me wonder what exactly God or Jesus is meaning when he uses this phrase, new with certainty, when I know that that's not always true in my own life. And that makes me think about when I, as a teacher, am talking to students sometimes, when I'm really manifesting more than I am recognizing something, like I'll say, 
I know that you respect your friend so much and you would not want to sabotage his opportunity to do well on this test by continuing to make dolphin noises every 10 seconds, <laughs> right? <laughs> And regardless of what the disciples were thinking or feeling, whether it was more of that like manifestation or whether it was a reality that they knew with certainty in their heart, they put themselves in the room, right? They acted as if they were certain that Jesus was the one. They were in that room with him at that critical time. And I think that's what Jesus is recognizing and celebrating more than anything else. For some of us, I think the connection between prayer and scripture and joy is just not there. Some of us have had scripture weaponized against us and it's inflicted wounds that are not healing well. Some of us feel when we pray that we're just shouting into the void. In his book, Shouting Into the Fire, Dante Stewart says, as I read the Hebrew Bible, I'm struck by two main verbs that refer to waiting. One is to wait with expectation. The other is to wait in the tension of enduring. It's not passive, it's an active struggle to live in the face of despair. We all live with despair sometimes, and some of us more so than others, again, often due to differences in genetics and life circumstances. It's why I don't really believe in the maxim, choose joy or choose happiness. How do you choose an emotion, right? It feels like a, to me, it feels like an invitation to perform something false. Instead, I look at the choices of the disciples. They couldn't choose to feel certain, but they could choose to act as if they were certain. They could choose to be in the upper room with Jesus. It's a silly example, but it reminds me of a TikTok I saw where a creator had gone for a walk because his therapist had suggested it, and he was like, I'm very disappointed to report that it is working and I do feel better, <laughs> right? It's about choosing to put your body in spaces and through activities and in relationship with people who will bring you that healing, who will help your well-being flourish. Jesus asked God, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is the truth. For them, I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. And we know that word sanctified does not mean to be made happy. It means to be purified to be renewed, to be made holy. And that is not an easy process. One of my favorite chapters in the Bible is Lamentations 3. It's an acrostic poem where each uh, verse starts with a, a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And it tells the human story of grief into joy, of mourning into dancing. It begins right out the gate I am the one who has seen affliction by the rod of the Lord's wrath. For 20 verses, the writer chronicles the affliction with this painful imagery. He has trampled me in the dust. I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. But in verse 21, the poem turns. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And the writer goes on to assert, let us examine our ways and test them and let us return to the Lord. In the midst of having just decried the antagonism of God against them, the writer has the fortitude to say, you know what? I know a deeper truth than that one. I know that God's mercies are new every morning. They rely on their experience of prior suffering and prior healing to help them endure their present suffering. The idea of joy and suffering being in two hands reminded me of this passage from my favorite book that I read last year, The History of Love by Nicole Krauss. She writes, the fact that you got a little happier today doesn't change the fact that you also became a little sadder. Every day you become a little more of both which means that right now at this exact moment, you're the happiest and the saddest you've ever been in your whole life. A mentor once told me as I cried to her in the midst of a late teenage breakdown, she said, you're going to get better at going through this. She said something happened to her when she got older. It wasn't that life got any easier, but rather she became stiller, she became sturdier less able to be rocked by the vicissitudes of life. 
And some years later now, I feel like I'm just starting to get a taste of what she meant. It's not that life becomes easier, but it's living that cycle of being knocked down harder than you could ever get up from and watching God pick you up again through that work and the love of your friends, through his nudges, through his undeniable sense of his presence. I trust him with the future because I know what he has done for me in the past. This side of heaven, many of our deepest experiences of God do come through the love and care of his people. We find joy in relationship with the divine and we find joy in relationship with each other. That same study I referenced earlier found that the happiest people had at least one person that they knew they could call in the middle of the night who would come help them. And the people in the study who had the lowest levels of happiness could not think of one person who could come help them. And again, that seems like just the most obvious thing to say, but how many of us really make social connection, social fitness a priority in our lives? I go to the gym for my physical fitness, I read, I do the Wordle every day for my mental fitness, but how much do I prioritize my social fitness? I've gotten the feedback since high school that I need to do better about being the one to initiate hangouts or phone calls. And it took me really until this year to start actively making a system to prioritize calling my friends. And those calls have brought me so much joy, so much delight, and yet still, every time I go to, make, to call someone, I think, oh, maybe I just don't quite have the energy for it today. Oh, what if it's awkward? What if I call at the wrong time? And so I stall, and I miss out on the opportunity for connection and for joy because of those voices in my head. I think of those voices in my head when I read Jesus' words, when he says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Some of the most insidious manifestations of the evil one in our lives is not the actions and words against us from others, but our own actions and words against ourselves. And it's powerful to think about Jesus praying that we would be protected from those thoughts, protected from those untruths that we levy against ourselves. That protection comes often in the form of friends who can step in and speak truth to you when you can't say it to yourself. Do we practice asking for that when we need it? We should, because Jesus says, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. How was Jesus sent into the world? Humble, lowly, an infant who grew into a loving man who honored and recognized each person who saw his reflection in each of us and sought to restore our relationship with God. This is how we are sent into the world, knowing with certainty or at least acting as if we know with certainty that we are loved and we are called to love others. And we're not sent in alone. We are backed by the always and forever love of God. Reminds me of something Paulo Coelho writes. She didn't need to understand the meaning of life. It was enough to find someone who did and then fall asleep in his arms and sleep as a child sleeps, knowing that someone stronger than you is protecting you from all evil and all danger. Because we are so deeply made for relationship, it can be devastating when the relationships that we value most are damaged or lost. And yet, in this world where joy and sorrow are in two hands, relational loss is inevitable. And so it is vital to understand that the most important relationship we have on this earth is our relationship with God. You all know the devastating phrase spoken by parents, employers, I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. I'd rather have pins stuck in my eyes than hear someone say that to me. <laughs> and mostly I associate people telling me I've disappointed them with times that I know I've messed up. Right, where I fell short of not just their expectations, but mine as well. And there are also times in our life when we disappoint people by making the right decision, just not the one that they wanted us to make. That kind of disappointment is really hard to deal with because it is often in the context of a relationship with a loved one, someone who is deeply invested in your choices. And it's so hard because when you disappoint someone and you know you messed up, you can apologize, you can say, I'm gonna change my behavior, and you can try to do better next time. But when you disappoint someone making the decision that is the right one, that is the one you know God is, God is calling you to, what can you do? There's nothing, there's nothing for you to do but to know in your core, in the deepest, most intimate self, 
that is the closest to God, that we do not wrestle flesh and blood, but principalities of the dark, as Paul says in Ephesians, and in the same way, we do not serve flesh and blood, but the one ruler of light who encompasses and transcends all of human experience and who loves us and knows us better than we know ourselves, who declares, and glory has come to me through them. We bring God glory. We bring ourselves his deep, lasting joy when we act as he has taught and called us. And part of that calling, and indeed our original calling on this earth, is to love, tend to, and be awed by creation. That word awe came up a lot in my study of joy this week. It turns out that, again, studies have found that in inducing humans to experience awe also increases their sense of community and closeness to others. Awe makes people feel small, the good kind of small, that makes you feel like you're part of something bigger than yourself. When I was a senior in college, the administration held a barbecue to celebrate our graduation. It's great food, great conversation, and at the end, they surprised us with a fireworks display in our honor. And I turned to my friend I was with, I said, this is so cool. Have you ever had fireworks set off for you? And he was like, meh. Nah, it's not the best fireworks show I've ever seen. <laughs> and I at first was just so sad that he was missing out on the joy of this experience. And then I felt convicted because I've been that person too, right? We've all been me and my friend in that situation. And it's not to say that we have to be delighted and awed by everything we come across. But when we do allow ourselves to be swept up in beauty, in excellence, in wonder, we open ourselves up to joy. Jesus is getting at this idea toward the end of his prayer when he says, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. When you step back and look at it, there are few stories so awe-inspiring as the gospel. The story of a great, all-powerful God who, for the love of his created children, took on bodily form to redeem them and offer them a companion to encourage and guide them throughout their life. It can sound ludicrous when you really think about it. If you're a Christian, are you awed by that story? Are you awed by Jesus, by God, and the work that he has done on your behalf? Awe often begets gratitude and vice versa. The most repeated command in the Bible is do not fear, but the second is praise or give thanks to God. Again, this is not about adding to your list of things you need to do to earn God's favor, but about training your body to see the good and appreciate it, to practice gratitude and raise Ebenezer's to the places that God has brought you, to offer yourself the sustenance of knowing what God has brought you through to bring you through the next challenge when things get hard. John Milton writes, gratitude bestows reverence, allowing us to encounter everyday epiphanies, those transcendent moments of awe that change forever how we experience life and the world. I was talking to someone at my city group last week about joy, and she brought up the story of Lazarus, an inherently joyful story, but she said, think about how Jesus must have felt. We know the famous verse, Jesus wept, right? He must have had tears streaming down his face. And he must have known the happiness that was gonna come from what he was about to do, but he also must have been experiencing indignance, even anger at death for taking his friend. You can hear the subtext in him when he calls Lazarus out of the tomb, saying, that is not where you are supposed to be. And it was this riotous mix of emotions that produced Jesus' most powerful miracle of raising his friend from the dead. And it was that same miracle that began the Pharisees' plot to kill Jesus, which was set in motion just hours after this prayer that he prays with them, in which he promises protection and joy for his disciples. A verse that might be familiar to some of you from Psalm 30 says, weeping may tarry for a night, but joy comes in the morning. One of my favorite bands, The Lone Bellow, took that verse and put it into a song, and their lyrics are, I'm done with all your lying, Joy comes in the morning, you won't see me crying. Then came the morning. It's this claiming of the promise of joy that joy will come in the morning. And then it shifts 
to an observation or a witnessing of that promise being fulfilled, then came the morning. That claiming and that witnessing, that's all of our breath prayer. When the lies of this world try to come at us to convince us that we shouldn't connect with those things that will bring us health and healing with the one person, the one person in Jesus Christ who can heal us from it within, that's our breath prayer. That's what we have to believe, that the morning will come. And the morning does come, just like it came the morning after this evening in the upper room, a morning that became a day in the midst of a week that ended with Jesus' long walk to Calvary to sacrifice himself for us, his joy, that he might be forever ours. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your astounding, awe-inspiring work on our behalf. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the ways in which you pursue us, the ways in which you come to know us more and more. I pray that you would call us to know you more and reveal your purpose for us every day of our lives, that we would experience your joy in our hearts. In your name we pray, amen.